Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from a, oh, just smashingly beautiful Macomb, Illinois. Uh, and we have got a great show for you today, folks. We're talking about spring flowers and taking pictures of spring flowers and kind of photography in general, some issues uh, uh, me and the other hosts we've been having with our questions, I would say, that we have about photography. So in, in that vein, um, listeners, if you are listening, this is going to be kind of a visual show. I will leave a link below in the description to our YouTube recording of this so you can see what we're talking about, but we will do our best to describe uh, what we are, are seeing on our screens uh, throughout the show, uh, so if you're just going to be listening only. Uh, our special guest today are actually going to be Mary Fisher. She's going to be returning from uh, last week, Horticulture Educator, and we are going to be have our very own producer and uh, Horticulture Program Coordinator, Wendy Ferguson to help us answer these photography questions because she in a previous life, and I say in this very life, is a, a photography guru. So, um, so we will be chatting with them later on here in the show. But before we get to them, let's introduce our co-host with us every single week. We have Katie Parker, local foods educator in Adams County. Hello, Katie. Hey, Chris. How are you doing? Ah, I am. I think we're in actual spring right now, like real spring, like Warm, sunny day, very cool, chilly nighttime. And I, I really like this weather. For, I'm just kind of really digging it right now. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing well. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. Um, I checked the weather this morning when I woke up, and I think we had like a, a morning temp of 36, which was a mm -hmm. bit chilly. Um, but yeah, this is, this is what your spring is. <laughs> you never know. Yeah, what you need you, to wear in the morning and then you're hot in the afternoon. So it's it is jacket shedding weather. So you right. put the jacket on in the morning and it's off by the afternoon. So mm -hmm. this is my favorite kind of weather. I call it hoodie weather because I like hoodies myself. So. Yeah. Did yeah. you guys have I, any frost last night? There was a chance of freezing, right? Well, I didn't no, see any didn't when I woke up. Um, and we have all of our, I left the plants out last night too. I'm just like, you know what? They're on their own, but not the tomatoes, not, not those guys, obviously, right. but you know, kind of the more hardy type veggies. So yeah, mm -hmm. they're, they're out in the pot still hardening off. So, cool. yeah, but someone who I know, um, he, he needs no hardening off because this guy is just as cold hardy as they come. Uh, horticulture educator, Ken Johnson in Jacksonville. Hey, Ken. Hello, Chris, Katie. I say I too left my plants outside last night. I did bring the cotton in and they get appreciate 30 degrees, but it's time to it's time to toughen up for all those other plants. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we uh, we didn't have frost, but it was a little breeze, not windy, but we had a breeze last night. So I wonder if that might have helped things not frost. Yeah. Possibly. Well, our topic for the show today is spring flowers and kind of some pictures we've been taking uh, here as we, we come along. And so we must introduce our special guest for today. So uh, re returning back back from last week is Mary Fisher, horticulture educator down near the Effingham area. Area. Hello, Mary. Hello, Chris. And hello for the rest of the committee here. Are uh, happy to have you back on the show and uh, sharing some, some pictures. And so I, I love... When, when Mary's on a, a Zoom call because she pops in with a different picture. Uh, sometimes it's of a like absolutely delicious looking cheeseburger or gumbo. Other times it's of a beautiful blooming plant down in the South. So um, I'm excited to see the pictures you have to share with us today, Mary. Well, thank you. And our other special guest for today is producer who's, well, she's kind of always here. But today, she's here, here. Uh, Wendy Ferguson, uh, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me back. Um, it's kind of interesting to be here on the, the camera side of things today. And then I'm, uh, I'm normally a black square. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you are on the camera side talking about cameras because, I mean, tell us a little bit. You uh, did photography before you were working with Extension, correct? Yes, I... Um, used to have a photography business where I did weddings and portraiture. Um, my passion was always nature photography. Um, so I, I, all my vacations were basically photo expeditions. Hmm. Um, but then I also did a stint as a studio photographer where I took children's portraits. 
and that which was oh my an i'm sorry issue uh, it, it was an interesting <laughs> um experience in patience and quickness timing mm -hmm. is everything in that so um yeah it was a lot of fun so i i did do some um uh, education, um, went to the Winona School of Photography and um, also have a associate's degree in fine art. So that's where the photography comes in. Well, and it, I'm sorry, my brain stuck on children's photography and, and having many <laughs> sessions of many children, um, man, you got a lot of squeaky tool, toys. You got, I mean, you have so many tricks just to get a child to like, look up, like, look, look mm -hmm. over here. And then dealing with a, a, a parent who's getting angry with their child for not cooperating. It's like, yeah, it, you're bringing horror story flashbacks to my, to myself. Oh, <laughs> man, those are long days. You, you've never actually done children's photography though, until you do the Easter portraits where you have <laughs> the baby bunnies or the baby lamb along with the children and the parents. Mm. Now that mm. is the classic image right there. Um, I, my first start was as the animal wrangler. Um, so <laughs> I would keep track of the animals, make sure the lambs didn't nibble on the lace of the, the little girl's dresses, things like that. Um, rescue the bunnies that have been swished off of the, the prop because the child didn't want it around it anymore, you know, things like that. So you're you know, a true photographer. I mean, really most... fun stuff. <laughs> I, I think most photographers, they just be like, you know what, let's just get the creepy guy in the bunny suit. It looks like he's going to kill everybody. Uh, but no, you're like, we're going to get an actual rabbit. We actually did live animals. Yes. <laughs> oh, goodness. Mm -hmm. Animals and kids. Animals and kids. The two things they say never work with. Uh, well, I, yes, my hat, my hat, my hat that is invisible is off to you. I'll put my invisible hat back on. Um so, wow. Well, Wendy, would you mind kind of going through a couple of pictures with us? So um, Ken, Katie, Mary, we've all kind of taken a few pictures. We have a few questions too about, you know, how, how things are going, um, but we'd like to share some pictures with our, 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 our viewers, listeners, um, and then also ask questions of you along the way. If you wouldn't mind helping us out, please. My pleasure. This is such a pretty picture, Chris. Oh, isn't it? <laughs> so I, Okay, this picture was something I was sitting out on our back deck, and right now our saucer magnolia is just in full bloom. And um, I'm like, I need to take a picture of this. It, like, I, I would think there's there's a there was a I think it was like a full moon. There's lots of kind of natural light for a nighttime, and I'm like, I, I think I can capture this. And I'm like sitting out there with we have a DSLR camera. I'm trying to take a picture, like trying all the different settings. And this is the only one that I could get anything to show up on. And it looks like a gross trail camera picture. <laughs> um, it is not at all what I was seeing with my eyeballs. So, Wendy, do you have any tips for taking pictures at night? Because uh, this is not going to work out. In the yes. Picture frame. One thing I would be willing to bet that you didn't use would be a tripod. I did not. It's probably why it's so blurry. <laughs> <laughs> that is one thing with night photography a tripod is your friend and that um, because even though you may be really steady um, when you're dealing with the shutter speeds or how um, long the window is open basically to let the light in to make the image you're, you're not going to be able to hand hold it and get a sharp in focus picture so tripod would be my first suggestion for you. The okay. second would be um, experiment with that um, shutter speed. Um, in photography, you're dealing with three different things that affects the quality of your picture. One is what they term ISO. Um, back in the day, it was your film speed. Um, it's a setting on your digital cameras now for ISO, which basically says how fast that image is gonna um, be recorded on your camera. Mm -hmm. So the higher the, the film speed or ISO, the less light and time it is needed to take that photo. So you have that one. Then you have the shutter speed and that is how fast basically the window on your camera is opening. Um, so if you wanted to capture say someone walking 
you would want to use the shutter speed of about 1 25th of a second. Mm -hmm. But if you want to blur water in a landscape, so on a river or a creek or something like that, you need to do at least a 30th of a second or longer. And that so nighttime, what you're looking at is probably going to be a longer shutter speed. So we're talking seconds, not tenths of seconds. So I would experiment with doing a one second, maybe a two second, five second exposure on a tripod. And that most cameras, if you do the self timer and hit it, then you won't even get the, the motion from pushing the shutter speed. So there's another way to reduce that. The other thing is, um, in terms of photography, not only the shutter speed, but your lens opening. So that's the aperture. And this is a little weird in the fact that the smaller the number, the bigger the opening. So it's exactly the opposite of mm. what you would think. So an f-stop of a three is actually a bigger opening than an f-stop of 11. What that controls is how much of your frame is in focus. The smaller the number, the more things are in focus. So by changing those three different things, you can control what happens in the photo. So for this, I would say a tripod is a must. Working on a longer shutter speed. I wouldn't necessarily say go up in film speed necessarily, because as you do that, you lose quality. It looks more grainy in the picture. And that so okay. try to find. Um, a medium ground, um, say maybe 200, 400, um, maybe an 800 speed. You're looking probably at f-stops wide open. Um, if you wanted to do the smaller so that more of the tree was in focus, you would need to go with a really long shutter speed. So you're, you're talking seconds on mm -hmm. that and that will give you a better picture. Interesting. So I have a little bit of t uh, tinkering with my camera settings. So I, mm -hmm. it, it, and as I was taking the pictures, exactly as you said, I was I, when I set it to auto, I think the camera was trying to compensate for the mm -hmm. low light it, to try to yep. get as much light through that lens as possible. So mm -hmm. it would take a long time, which means I would jiggle the camera and you get a blurry image. Right. Exactly. Okay. So could I, could I ask another quick question too? Mm -hmm. I, I really wanted to shoot the star with what you just described. Like this is the first star I see every single night. It's poking mm -hmm. right up above this tree. So increase my shutter, my shutter speed, or my length of time that that lens is open mm -hmm. tripod. Um, here I was like holding the camera on a, a table and angling it up. Mm -hmm. um, so we're just sitting on the, on the patio there. Yep. Um, so I, I would probably be able to capture better photos and get a, more of that light into the lens, correct? Mm -hmm. The one thing with stars, and this is, I'm sure you've probably seen the photos where they've got like the star trails. Yes. That happens when you leave the shutter open for a really long period of time. Oh, okay. That, so like minutes and that. So you can um, experiment with that. That would do something like that. Um, also, um, there's actually probably more light than at dusk than you realize. And so um, to get you know more of a black sky rather mm -hmm. than the blue sky so you can see the star you know and the contrast is there, you might want to wait till later in the evening, depending okay. on when that star is you know kind of moving on your horizon a bit since oh, we're so moving. Cool. <laughs> well, I am excited to experiment here this spring with uh, different shutter speeds and taking photos at night because as we, we had Mary on last week talk about night blooming plants and I'm like I want to take pictures of these things I want to see them at night so awesome well thank you Wendy you're welcome uh so the spring blooming flower that I'm going to share are helibores or also known as Lenten roses um these are something that we came across probably within the last five years um, and it seems like once we find something we like, we just kind of obsess over it. And so uh, we've picked up quite a few helibores over the time. But um, yeah, they usually bloom earlier in the season. 
Uh, you can see a lot of times the flower head uh, is looking down at the ground, which is something cool about them. Um, but yeah, I just, I just like them. They look so delicate, I think. And then their coloration as well. You often find them in whites and creams, and then also this rose color. Um, so the rose color and the white one are um, three that we have in our yard. This peach one, um, we were on a walk when I lived in St. Louis and I saw it and I'm like, oh my gosh, there's helibores because it's not something that I've seen a lot in, in people's yards. Uh, so it was exciting to see that. I'm sure the people that owned the house thought I was crazy for taking pictures of plants in their yard, but um, I thought it was worthwhile to stop to take a picture. Katie, I was just, I was going to add, um, I take so many pictures of other people's yards. Uh, people probably, yeah. I've probably been getting a name around the neighborhood. Like, who is this guy? So, is this yeah. creep? Yeah. I, I saw, I was taking a picture of somebody's uh, Amsonia Hubrechtii, the Ar Arkansas Blue Star. I was taking pictures of it emerging from the ground by their driveway and they like walk out and I'm like, hi. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for growing such beautiful plants. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm going to use this in a presentation. <laughs> All right. No, it's but always yeah, I, better to, <laughs> to not like know anybody. That's the nice thing about St. Louis. <laughs> they, mm -hmm. they don't know you. Exactly. But, uh, <laughs> as long as you're not trespassing, I think you're good. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's where a good, nice telephoto lens will come in handy. <laughs> right. <laughs> I think, well, yeah, you can kind of see it in uh, this picture on the right, but something that I've always had issues with is shadows in my pictures. And I know that obviously you can um, move to kind of block light or also move to not block the light, but are there any other tips that you have to prevent shadows in our photos? There are ways to minimize the shadows. Um, with um, objects, a lot of times photographers will shoot them um, in a um, covered dome, which basically is like a light box where they'll have the light going through this box. So it, it gives it a nice soft diffused light. If you're not doing it in a studio setting, what you can do is a piece of white foam core if you put that and angle that, you can bounce light into those shadows and that you may have to experiment, but you will be able to see the difference with that. Um, a lot of times when I was doing portraiture outside, there's no way to minimize shadows sometimes based on the time of day that you have to shoot. And that's when they were available to do the 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 photographs. And so um, if you take, there's fancier, you know, you can buy them photographic reflectors, um, but a piece of foam core works just as well and is a whole lot cheaper. Um, just take a, a sheet of that and angle it underneath so that it's going to get the light and then bounce it up. And okay. that, so um, that's one way to, to do that. Conversely is if you've got really harsh shadows, you can get a piece of um, nylon and stuff that's going to diffuse the light. And that, so those are, are two ways that you can manipulate. That sounds easy enough to try. Mm -hmm. It is. And it's kind of fun once you see what actually happens. Right. With yeah. The, the, the light bouncing. It's, it can be really frustrating because the pen, like no, any way that you move, it seems like you still always have a shadow and you want to get a good picture, but it seems impossible sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes on that, the best thing is to embrace the shadow and right. just get into where all you see is the shadow and uh -huh. that way you're going to get a, a better exposure because the camera's not going to see the contrast between your highlights and your shadows. Okay. And that's why sometimes taking a photo on an overcast day is better mm -hmm. than taking a, a shot at the height of, you know, harsh shadows and sun. We also have a couple pictures uh, that Mary has uh, shared with us. So Mary, uh, you have some, some beautiful pictures. I, I absolutely love the color red of this. What are we looking at? Um, this is a red azalea. So the flowers are not as big as the older kind of 
lilac purple color that you know you typically see. Um, of course, you know I was in Louisiana and everybody and their cousin had azaleas blooming. These were some on my property. Now it looks like I got my finger in the picture too. Um, but the, the color was really pretty. It's kind of a salmon red and I wanted to take some pictures of it. Um, these plants are probably 60 plus years old. Um, so in the market, it's hard to find these anymore. Um, but with, you know, kind of what Wendy was saying about, you know, the shadow and the light, um, I feel it kind of washed the color out where when you show them the picture of the camellia, you can see the difference. Um, so it's like, and uh, these are all taken with my iPhone. Um, so, you know, to me, that's a big problem. I want to get better pictures, but probably what the camera I'm going to have is going to be my iPhone. Mm -hmm. So if we compare that with the camellia, I mean, look at that. Wow. Now in the camellia, I took it midday, but it was on overcast day and it had just rained and I was walking by and I saw the water droplets on it and I thought that would make a beautiful picture. So I took that picture and I was able to get really close. You can see that this one is actually called Purple Dawn Magnolia. Uh, this is on a shrub that's probably 75 years old, about the size of a, a full cab size, a uh, crew cab pickup. Mm -hmm. um, but you can see that the edges are just tinted a light purple. So that's how it got its name. Um, and you can see all the venation in it. So I thought it was a much better picture than the other one. So what do you think, Wendy? Um, I would say that um, one of the things that is key here is um, the difference in your light quality. You said the um, camellia is a uh, the overcast day, whereas I would be willing to bet that the picture that you took on, yep, you can see that it was a harsher light because you've got some really bright um, highlights on some of right. the petals. It was that, full sun. Mm -hmm. So in order to get that, um, so the camera is in your iPhone and um, if you're using a DSLR or any of those are trying to average make everything basically 18% gray and that. Hmm. So when it sees the contrast, it's, it's harder and it's, it's not as easy to do when you're in an overcast day. So part of that is just the different times of day. So that's why you'll find photographers saying, oh, going out at the golden hour. And usually that's at dawn and at dusk. Um, one is because of the angle of the light and also the, the um, harshness or not. Um, and that, so um, I would play around if you wanted to take, you know, more pictures of your azalea um, with different times of day on that. Also know that our eyes can see a much bigger range of color than any camera can. And that so it's the camera is always going to be less accurate, less vivid, um, especially in the blue range, um, than uh, our our eyes will be. And that so um, unfortunately, um, technology is not quite there yet to to capture exactly what our eye is seeing. So that's kind of a, an important reminder to keep at the back of your head too, if it's not quite the way you remembered it or if you're looking at it and stuff. So, um, but I would try, you know, different quality of, of light, um, different times of day um, to see. Also, um, what the one thing that's striking about this particular, the camellia, um, is that you got real nice and tight. Um, it allowed it to focus on a smaller, you know, just the one bloom. And so you don't have all of the other um, leaves behind it in sharp focus too. So that's um, a really effective way to do individual flowers. So this one, the camera probably chose a 
lens opening that was bigger because the bigger the opening, the less in focus from foreground to background is gonna be. And um, so if you're doing what I call plant portraits, and that's what I would call this photo, um, that's one way to do that and to make sure that um, the portrait you wanna take, which is of the blossom, is in the sharpest focus. And thanks for those tips, Wendy. I'm curious, Wendy, with plant portraits, I often see people or photographers like wet down a plant or maybe a hardscape. Mm -hmm. Is that, I mean, I think I love seeing the water droplets on here. Is that kind of a common practice? It is. Um, also, you'll see um, a lot of the water droplets because photographers are out in the early morning where the dew is still Makes clinging sense. Yeah. and stuff. So um, it just adds interest mm -hmm. to the, the portrait or um, the photo. Um, also, if you're doing insects, I know, Ken, you probably um, like to take pictures of, of different insects that you see. They're less active with the colder, you know, morning light and stuff. So um, a lot of times you'll see them um, in those areas. People who also do insect portraits, um, they do use cooling um, ways to, to cool down the, the um, subject matter and that so they're not as active and so they can take pictures. They also use a longer focal length macro lens versus a wider angle. Um, macro lenses come basically in, in two different ways. You have like a 50 millimeter macro where you can get up, you know, to inches away from your subject matter. The problem with that is some things don't want you that close and they'll either let you know about it in an unfriendly way or they'll just leave. And so to do those types of subjects, a focal length of say a hundred millimeter will allow you to be about six feet away, but still get that really tight close up size. So knowing which lens to use for the subject matter is also helpful. You'll say probably have more insect pictures than I do plant pictures. Yeah. <laughs> Spring insect pictures next week on yep. the Good Growing Podcast. <laughs> we can do that. <laughs> I love this picture right here that you took, Mary. So this is a, is this a pawpaw flower that is opening? Yes, it's a pawpaw flower. Um, I knew, you know, you only have a, a short window of time to be able to look at these things. So it was late in an afternoon. Uh, the sun was already starting to set and I zoomed out there with the phone to take pictures because I could get that nice sharp bud. Um, at the top and then I could see the flower blossom starting to open and then at the very bottom you can just see that little tiny fuzzy little um, bud down there as well um, and I thought this would, had a lot of what I wanted um, because I was asking the picture to take get this subject in focus more, it faded out the background, which mm -hmm. I thought was made it a much better picture, kind of like what Wendy's been talking about. Yeah, the other thing that makes this a very effective photograph is the composition. You've got nice diagonal lines, which create movement with your eye because it draws the viewer into the frame from the bottom corner up to the blossom. And that, so that's another design trip in terms of composition for people who take a lot of photos is to think about how you're framing the photograph. And that so also having that um, branch right behind it kind of paralleling that it emphasizes and draws your eye to the, the pawpaw blossoms. That and the fact that you've got such lovely detail um, that you can see the individual little um, hair-like um, things on the outer coating. I, I just love it. Thank you. And I wasn't even planning this picture. I'm almost <laughs> like, I just want that picture. <laughs> it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah it is very Thank good. You. And then Mary, you have this wildflower right here. Now yeah, that, that was a sad picture. 
<laughs> but I, I think, but is there a way we could enhance something like this? Well, and that's why I, I sent it to you. So Wendy could look at it and tell us what could we have done better? Of course, now the day it was very sunny. Um, I did stand in the shadow because you can see where there's sun off to the mm -hmm. upper right. So I stood in the shadow so I could try to get a better picture of the flower. But I mean, still they're small. <laughs> yeah. This is another case where a tripod can be your friend. They make tripods where you can reverse the center column and get your camera down to ground level Neat. and have it all set up. That way you can get down really tight and really close. And um, if you were still getting some of that um, harsher light, that's where another um, diffuser or um, what they call a gobo, which would stop that light. Um, basically it's a black piece of foam core that you could do um, to, to make that light a little bit more diffused on that. But um, tripod is one of your, your best friends in terms of taking good quality um, photographs and that. So um, I would probably take um, the photo with the tripod sitting over that little flower with the center column switched so that you could get the camera right down towards the ground. Um, that also makes it easier. So you're not necessarily laying on the ground, taking the photo yourself, though that is another mm -hmm. option. And that changing your position, you don't always just have to stand when you're taking photographs, um, look up, look down, get down on the ground um, for a different viewpoint. That'll add interest to your photos as well. Okay, and I, I do have a couple of tripods um, that I can attach to my phone. So, you know, it's sort of like the only, the only good tripod is the one you have with you. Exactly. Um, so I'll have to try that. But I was actually at a training this day, so I didn't go out just to take pictures of flowers. Yeah, so what I do is I always have my tripod in my car. Uh, it's just something that, you know, I've had them stolen out of my car, but I always have one in my car. Of course, they, they stole the tripod when they stole the car, but oh. that's a whole nother story. <laughs> You're very mad about the tripod, though. <laughs> yep, I was mad about the tripod. You know, they could have taken the car. Tripod probably was, you know, the better of the equipment. But um, so I always carry the tripod in my car with me so that if I do want it or do need it, it's, it's there and that. And just like you always have your, your cell phone, your iPhone uh, camera with you, um, I carry a camera with me all times. And that it's just a matter of habit because that's always gonna be the one time that you're gonna go, oh, that would have been perfect. Yeah. And, that, so. and I, I know the one tripod I have is only about a foot long, but then it has the little legs that will expand so you could get mm -hmm. it taller. Um, so it, it's like, it would be something you could just like throw in a bag and yep. throw over your shoulder and bring with you. So that's mm -hmm. a good point. It's like, well, let's see, black foam core, white foam core and a tripod. Yep. Will be things I have to have in the car. Yep. And also I think people in my neighborhood think I'm crazy because I'm always laying down in the ground in our yard <laughs> taking pictures. <laughs> Someone but that's the call best ambulance. View a lot of times. <laughs> I think sometimes I get dirtier taking pictures than I do gardening. I know I have. <laughs> Must mean you're doing it right. All right. So this is the picture, some of the pictures I have. So these are the tulips we have. Um, in our yard going up our front walk so you can see the uh, the kids water table up there at the top uh, mm -hmm. going up to our stairs um, and I took this picture these are I took these yesterday it's probably about three four o'clock so those that's why all the kind of the longer shadows there I mean these are the kind of the individual tulips we have blooming right now and let me get my cheat sheet out and I can tell you what's what all right so starting at the the bottom left and going uh, clockwise we've got foxtrot um, this one's supposed to have a pink tinge to it, so that may be one that kind of comes on later um, as it kind of develops more. Um, then above that is Annalita. Um, and with this one, that, that kind of pinkish area, that started off as kind of white, almost cream color, and then it's transitioned into a, a pink, and some of them are even darker pink um, than that. Uh, then above that is Princess Irene, that orange and, and kind of purplish 
bloom there. Uh, then orange emperor, uh, apricot delight. Rem's favorite is that purple and white uh, color there. Negrita is that, that solid purple bloom. Um, then salmon pearl on the bottom right. Um, Merit is that kind of the pinkish reddish yellow one. And then Jap Groot is that yellow and you can see that yellow has got some lighter yellow in it too, kind of broken up in there in that uh, bloom. And then World Peace um, is that kind of orange salmon yellow one. So we've got a few more that haven't bloomed yet. They've, they've sent, up, sent up their buds, but um, they should be blooming here in a few days, hopefully. I, um, I really feel like tulips are something that I have not appreciated as much because in the landscape trade, we treat them as annuals. You know, we plant them in the fall and then they bloom and then we rip them out. But I've had some of these pop up in my landscape and these pictures can, there's so much happening, like the color, the contrast. It's like, I, I am, I have a newfound respect for tulips. So these are beautiful. See, growing up, we, we just kind of had like the red ones and the yellow ones. And then, you know, when you kind of get into it, you look at some of these catalogs, especially the companies that specialize in, in bulbs, there's a, a ridiculous amount of diversity and some of the ones we haven't had bloom yet are kind of fringed um, petals and stuff so when those start blooming I can share those too um, and then some other um, flowers um, so Mary had these two so these are spring beauty um, so this big picture here this this kind of this field here this is Duncan Park in Jacksonville uh, and a good chunk of the park is just full of spring beauty like this so you kind of look at the park and it's almost solid white um, in some areas. And this is only a portion um, of that. Um, and you can see kind of close up um, those flowers there. So this is why I did my, uh, for the, the good growing article this week. So if you want to read more about these, you can check that out. Um, but you can see, you know, these from a distance, these flowers look white, but if you kind of get a close up there, like on the, the top left there, you can see they actually have these uh, kind of pink lines on them and stuff. So, and then, um, bottom there, there's a surfed fly um, visiting one of the flowers. I couldn't pass up an opportunity to take a picture of an insect. Did you have to roll on the ground for this one? I, I was kneeling on the ground. So, since this was in the park, I didn't want to get get too weird looking. <laughs> people. And people walk their dogs in there, so you never know what you're going to be laying on. Um, and I'll say for, for insect pictures, um, you were talking about that, Wendy, with uh, the macro lenses. I've got some macro lenses are kind of out of the budget at the moment. So I've got, I've using, um, I didn't use it for this picture, but some of the pictures I've taken, I've got extension tubes mm -hmm. um, that kind of do that. That would be the other way the to do it. Yep. On a budget, those only cost 30, $40 compared mm -hmm. to three, $400. That is true. Yep. They um, also make close up filters that mm -hmm. will magnify your image too. Yeah, I've got one of those that kind of clips on the end of the, it's mm -hmm. like a magnifying glass clips yep. on the end. And I found with that, it kind of distorts, at least the one I have, I got a, a cheap one, distorts the edges. Yeah, you, you do have to make sure you're buying a, a good quality glass on, on that. So, and then the question I had, and it's kind of um, piggybacking off what Mary had. So, you know, we talked about time of day, you know, early or late is a lot of times better. But if, you know, if you have to take pictures, you know, kind of middle of the day where the sun's really harsh, you know, you don't mm -hmm. really have much of an option because some flowers like the spring beauty, they only open up when it's real sunny out and stuff. Mm -hmm. You have any tips for that to kind of prevent that those pictures from getting kind of washed out because of the bright light. One thing is to change if you can on your camera, or I don't know that you can do that on a, an iPhone, but um, where it's metering. So where it's taking its light reading, if you're letting it do um, uh, it automatically. Um, you want to, to aim that meter at, um, if you want highlights or if you want detail in the shadow, you want to meter there. If you want detail in the highlights, you want to meter at that point. So it depends on where you're taking that light reading. Now, if you don't have an option of, you know, changing all of that, um, that's where the um, phone core um, to block some of that light will help. And that so you're not, so you're casting part of it in shadow and, and basically evening out that, that light. 
in it. But um, it is yeah. harder we'll on those the <laughs> things where you got that. <laughs> but sometimes too, also embracing uh, the shadows. And that um, one of the things I liked about your tulip pictures were the interesting shadows that you had behind that. Because those make a whole nother part of the composition. Um, so sometimes um, what you weren't planning on, on adding in there, add something to your photograph. So don't be afraid to look at the same scene slightly differently. You know, if you're shooting pictures of the tulips, that long shot of up your walk, that shadow all along the sidewalk was, would have made a really cool photo of just the shadows. You know, if you cropped in on just those. Um, I took one photo where it was snow on the roof of a greenhouse. I tight, you know, cropped in tight enough that it made the snow look like those were the clouds and everybody swore it was a sky picture, but it was actually snow on the roof. So um, think about things in slightly different ways of, you know, than your typical, oh, I'm taking a picture of a flower. I'm taking a picture of an insect. You know, what can you do to make it a little bit um, more unique on that? So, but that's the artsy part. <laughs> it's the stuff that makes for good PowerPoints. Exactly. <laughs> I'm waiting. Okay, Ken, I, I'm excited for this, the, the picture of this tulip shadow. So we can go out maybe later today, in the sunny day. That would be a really cool background photo. See what I can do for you. All right, all right, <laughs> I'll pay you, don't worry. I know you charge. <laughs> well, that was a lot of interesting information on photography, uh, funful, playful ways to manipulate the photons in our life uh, and capture those, whether it's on film or for most of us, an SD card, uh, some type of microchip. Uh, but we are also a question and answer show. And so we do have some homeowner questions that have come in. Uh, so Wendy, as our special guest today, uh, would you mind reading us uh, these questions, uh, please? I would be delighted to. So our first question is from Adams County. Um, they write, I bought Blooming Spring bulbs in containers for Easter. Is it okay to cut the foliage and dead blooms off of my bulbs before I plant them in the ground. Yeah, so I would not recommend doing this. Um, so when you're wanting to plant the spring blooming bulbs to another spot or from the pot to um, someplace in your landscape, you'll wanna wait until the foliage has turned yellow. Our spring bulbs need that foliage to produce food for the bulbs for the next, the next growing season or the next year. So it's uh, important that we let that die back naturally. Um, so if you want, you can just put the bulbs or the pot in a cool, dry place um, and let that die back. And then you can either um, leave them a pot or take them out and let them dry out. And then you can plant those again in the fall. Uh, so I would not remove any of that foliage uh, from your, any of your spring bulbs. Yeah, I just had a question from a, a person yesterday saying, why did my daffodils bloom the first year and not the second year? And I asked them when they cut the foliage on the first year bloom and they did it before it turned all yellow and stuff. Right. So. It's, it's not pretty, uh, or, or it's not the prettiest thing, but it's important that we, that we leave that there. And especially if it's something that's in pots that you bought, like you can keep that out of sight um, like Ken years is next to your front walk. We have a bunch of bulbs next to our front walk. It's just something you have to embrace. Yeah, they were gonna we're gonna plant some other some annuals and stuff around that to kind of draw the attention away. You saw that we had that big gap of mulch there with mm -hmm. nothing in there. We're gonna plant sunflowers and stuff in there. So hopefully draw some of that attention away from the the less attractive <laughs> tulip foliage just left behind. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, and our next question is from McDonough County. Will the cold night temperatures affect my snapdragons that I just planted in a container? So the interesting thing is that um, flowers 
kind of like vegetables. We have cool season veggies and warm season veggies. We also have cool season flowers and warm season flowers. And Snapdragon is a cool season flower. So, I mean, I, I think where we're at here in McDonough County, you know, we're sitting right at the smack dab middle of April. We should be okay. But we can get those freak freezes, freeze events that, that can occur up into the first or second, even second week of May uh, for us in central Illinois. So, Snapdragons being a cool season flower probably will be fine. Looking ahead at the forecast, our lows are not expected to dip below freezing, I, I believe, here in Macomb. But snapdragons are about hardy to about 20 degrees. If you get in the 20s, then you start getting freeze damage. Uh, I, I think, based on our forecast, based on being snapdragon, the foliage will definitely be okay. The plant will be fine. Will the cold temps affect the flower buds? Maybe. I mean, the effect might just be slowing them down, and that would might be a good thing. They might last a bit longer for you. Now, being in a container, that might be one other thing I'm thinking about in that how large is the container? Uh, because when they're planted in the ground, the roots are very protected. They're very insulated in that soil, but being above ground in a container and a soil-free mix, uh, it, it might not be as insulating as the ground. So might get uh, freeze damage if we dip below freezing into the 20s, which we're not expected to. And the last thing I will say is that if these came straight from a warm, cozy greenhouse and you put them right in your container, they might not have been hardened off. And so, yes, they might experience a, a freeze damage, but it's maybe not necessarily related to the freeze just because they aren't hardened off and you're going from a warm greenhouse right into the, your front yard in a container. So all, all things to consider, but I, I would assume that as looking at the forecast, we're going to be fine. Okay. And then from Morgan County, they would like to know how to get rid of Creeping Charlie. Well, you tell Creeping Charlie to stop taking pictures in your front yard. So you might have to do a restraining <laughs> order or something. So I, yeah, that's just got to watch out for him. Yeah, that's the, that's the million dollar question right there. <laughs> um, so what I usually tell people with Creeping Charlie, and if you don't have a lot of it, it's fairly easy to hand pull. Um, and if you've got large areas of it, that may not be something um, you really want to do, but that is always an option is hand pulling. <laughs> Um, there are some herbicides you can use, some of the, the broadleaf herbicides, um, the MCPP, 2,4-D. Um, there's some, some stuff that's got a combination of 2,4-D, MCPP, and dicamba. And those are typically marketed as broadleaf herbicides um, for turf and stuff. Um, it will do a fairly good job of, of managing that. You may need to apply it a couple of times, um, but just read the label on that. Uh, typically, the best time to apply those um, herbicides to them is going to be kind of April, June time frame, and then October, November. A lot of times fall herbicide is, works a little bit better because those plants are getting dormant um, and they're kind of sending the energy and stuff down to the root system um, so that that herbicide moves in that plant um, a little bit better. Um, you know, you could always go a, a non-selective like a glyphosate um, that's going to kill everything it touches. Um, as well, if you're not concerned with with turf, if it's in a um, like a flower bed or something like that, and you're not going to hit your more desirable plants, that would be an option too. Or just and embrace it and let it take over. Let yeah, enjoy the flower show. And if it's also in turf, I you know it's how you take care of your lawn. I always say my my three rule mantra: mow high, mow often, and keep your blades sharp. You know, that'll help with those broadleaf weeds. We have a question from Scott County. When is the best time to spray for bagworms? Well, I'm going to tackle this one. So usually bagworms are found in your spruce, your cedar, your arborvitae, and they have those nice little cocoon looking things that are attached and dangling all over the place. But the thing about spraying is you have to time it just when the eggs are hatching and the small larvae appear. And one of the things that I feel that a lot of people have forgotten is to observe. And so what you're gonna to have to start doing is going out and looking. Typically, they start to hatch in late May to early to mid June, depending on where you are. So you're gonna to have to get out there and start looking at it. So there's a new field it's probably not new actually, it's probably old. Um, it's called phenology. 
And so this is when you study reoccurring events. And I heard about a study recently that I thought was just utterly fascinating. It was on flowering cherries. They actually have 1,200 years of data on these flowering cherry trees in Kyoto, Japan. And I thought that was just amazing that someone actually took time to write all this stuff down. And basically that's what you're gonna to have to do with phonology. You're gonna to have to start uh, writing down when you see certain events. Now, what has been kind of an emerging pattern, especially um, in the landscape, is uh, to watch for phenological indicator plants. And for most of us in the area, it's catalpa trees and it's Japanese tree lilacs. So when they start to bloom, that's about the same time as the bagworms start to, their eggs start to emerge or hatch and, and the little larvae start to come out. So sometimes you can find out something without having to go and look at each little individual bagworm by looking at this indicator plant. Now it doesn't mean the indicator plants have the bagworms, but through observations, they've found when these are in bloom, this is when those eggs usually start to hatch. And then that's the time you want to spray when they're present. And for most of us, um, it, we're kind of like a day late and a dollar short. You know, they're already hatched. And then we go, well, what are we going to do? And it's like, well, you can't do anything. There's no use spraying because the damage is already done. They're free, you know. Um, so, again, timing the spray at the right time when those eggs are hatching. Look at some of your indicator plants. Um, get out there and observe it yourself if you have to. Jot it down. Um, in the agronomic crops, um, there's something that they call growing degree days. And growing degree days help them to determine when are they possibly gonna have any kind of emergence of pests. So they'll, they already kind of know about when they have to get out in their fields and start doing some crop scouting. So this is very similar to that, um, except we're looking at our landscapes. So I hope that helps. Right now, you can still go out and hand pick those bags. The more you pick off, the less fewer caterpillars you're going to have hatching. So keep if you've got them on your trees, go out and pick them now. And, and when you are picking them, don't throw them on the ground; they'll still hatch out and crawl up. So smush them, put them in water, drown them, burn them, put them in the garbage. Some way destroy them or get them off your landscapes. So they're not hatching out and and reinfesting your plants. So medieval, Ken. My goodness. <laughs> And our last question is also from Scott County. They would like to know how to control wild onion in their turf. So this is would kind of be like um, the creeping Charlie. Um, you can hand pull that when I have it in my yard. Um, after we get a rain, I'll usually try to go out and hand pull some stuff. It's a little bit easier when that soil is nice and moist to pull that out. Um, I found that the kind of the bigger clumps are easier to hand pull than individual plants when you get that whole clump. Kind of you get a, a big clump of soil that comes up with it and they all come out fairly easily without breaking off um, at the soil level. Um, I've, I've read you can use broadleaf herbicides, but I think we were discussing beforehand, a lot of people don't necessarily have a lot of success um, using some of those broadleaf herbicides on wild onion. Um, again, you could use the glyphosate or something like that, that broad spectrum that's going to kill everything. You're just going to have to go in and and reseed or, or something like that with your turf. Um, I don't know for me, I once you cut it a few times, it doesn't get, it's not all that noticeable. So I just kind of live with it. And when you're cutting the grass, you know when you've hit some. Well, before the show, I really like Mary's suggestion. You take boiling water, you dump it on the onions, and then you take that over to your potatoes and you mix them all together and you got a potato onion stew. I, am I the only one who is hungry right now? <laughs> throw some grubs in there. And... But it's, yeah, some grubs to get some protein. Look for some mushrooms. Mm -hmm. 
Make a potato that, salad. Hmm. All right. Well, that was a lot of great information. I am planning my lunch right now, uh, folks. I got some wild onion to harvest and some grubs to dig up. Um, no, no, no. Uh, but <laughs> Wendy and Mary, thank you so much for being on the show today. That was so much fun. It was. Yes, it was. Thanks for having me. Well, the Good Growing Podcast is produced by Wendy Ferguson and edited by me, Chris Enroth. A special thanks to our co-hosts, Ken and Katie, for being with us every single week. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for all the tips, Wendy. And it was good to have you back, Mary. And yeah, and it was nice. It was nice to be back. And and yeah, thanks for all the tips, Wendy. That'll be real helpful. My pleasure. Everybody should get out and take some photos. <laughs> yes, thank you, Mary. And thank you, Wendy Hill. Try to dig out that owner's manual now and <laughs> learn my camera better. <laughs> and Chris, Katie, thank you as always. Let's do this again next week. Oh, we yeah. shall do this again next week. <laughs> we are going to be talking about disasters, landscape disasters, and how we can prepare our yards for this with a, a community and economic development educator, Kiri McKillop. She'll be on the show. We'll be talking about all the worst things that uh, can be happening out in our yard. And we're not talking about Creeping Charlie this time. Uh, we're talking about real disasters. So listeners, thank you for doing what you do best and that is listening or if you're watching us on YouTube, watching. And as always, keep on growing. Wendy, we need to talk about your tips and tricks for photog photographing children. No doubt. I've got a lot of them. Don't ever tell them to say cheese because you'll get oh, really? The, the really funny grin you know, where they're like, eh. um, <laughs> have them say pickles. It's a more relaxed. Pickles. Facings. Pickles. Oh, and yeah, they get a kick face. out of saying pickles. Um, if you want them to stay in one spot, put a coin down and t tell them to put their foot on it and don't let you see the coin. Because if they don't, if they let you see the coin, they don't get it afterwards. Oh. And so you bribe them. Yeah. So <laughs> that always works with kids. Interesting. So those Glad are I'm recording this. <laughs> <laughs> Put this in the blue place.